Nice. Then, yeah, let's slowly start after lunch. It's going to be tough, maybe. Let's see. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us today. So, my name is uh, Pierluigi. I'm a product designer working at Snap Mobile. And my name is uh, Enrique. I'm a Kotlin um, Android GD working as an Android developer with, uh, with Pierre. And if you want some uh, Kotlin Weekly stickers, stay till the end of the talk. Cool. So yeah, today we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, designing for foldables and more in general about like larger design, sc um, larger uh, um, screens. So if we talk about like design and building up for larger screens, I think this is not really uh, a new thing, right? So uh, tablets have been around for a while, Chromebook as well. Actually, interesting enough, we had a talk about um, called like Beyond the, Beyond the Smartphone Screen a couple of years ago at DroidCon. And uh, there we were actu actually just talking and uh, looking a little bit into the rise of Chromebooks back then and how actually Android App could uh, run also like on uh, Chromebooks. I mean, uh, supporting different form factors, nothing new for Android, for example, when it compared to, to iOS. Uh, but uh, moving or running also Android apps on, uh, on Chrome OS would mean that effectively you would have like much wider range of resolutions, which becomes like almost infinitive. So um, you kind of get closer also to patterns that are from web design. Um, these, if the video runs, yeah, it's just an example of an app that we used, that we were working on. Um, to run on, uh, on Chrome OS, and you can see that effectively when uh, you are on larger screens and you scale the window, the, the app behaves pretty fluidly. So effectively there is no, um, yeah, no defined um, adaptive design, but becomes very, very similar to, to responsive design. Uh, now we have foldables. So foldables are kind of newish category. Uh, I would say they are kind of a hybrid category because if we look at the devices we have on the market, we have like smaller devices, phones, we all carry them around. Um, they are pretty easy to, uh, yeah, to, to, to bring them everywhere. Uh, but then when we have other use cases, like for example, when we want to consume more content or be more productive, then we switch to larger screens. And effectively, foldables are kind of trying to bridge that gap, so effectively bringing or maximizing the portability of uh, smaller devices, but also like bringing the, the better experience of larger screens. So how do they look like? In terms of hardware, I guess you have like probably three major categories. You have like flexible uh, screens that kind of fold inwards, like most of the Samsung foldables. You also have like screens that flex uh, or fold outwards. Um, in this case, like you might have like um, upsides, like you don't need like an outsider or um, uh, yeah, a screen outside because it folds uh, already. Um, but for example, your, your larger screens then um, can be um, exposed to more scratches when you put it in your pocket. Then you also have like um, the Windows Surface Duo, we use like another approach. They have effectively two screens joined mechanically, which makes the device much more robust, but at the same time you always have this gap in between, right in the middle, so which um, you will always see. You don't have a continuous screen. Asian manufacturers um, yeah, are uh, uh, the, the ones who own most of the market. Samsung taking the lead, about two-thirds of, uh, of the market share for Samsung. But of course, like, there are new models and new OEMs coming in. So what's coming next? Um, Pixel Fold might be the new thing this year. Let's see. Uh, other OEMs also announced new models like the OnePlus V, uh, which could be released this year. And there are also like potential new prototypes coming in. Um, this was unfortunately uh, uh, yeah, uh, a prototype who was um, announced by, uh, by LG and then removed right before the release. 
It's about rollables, so it's a slightly different technology. Uh, you don't have to fold the screens because it rolls, so it extends when you need it. So the, the device is also thinner because you don't have the double layer. But of course, like, it's a technology that has not been proven yet on the market. And then you also have like, uh, some potential new prototypes. So you have hybrids, so that combines kind of foldables and rollables together, or multifolds approach. So let's see what, what will happen. Uh, but of course, like, the market is still tiny for, for this segment, but it's growing quite fast. Uh, so it's good to keep an eye on it. Uh, there, are, there is expected to be like about 50% growth this year. Let's see how it goes with new models coming in as well. So, uh, let's go this way. Um, so we said like there are some interesting interactions and use cases that are better on larger screens. So let's see what those could be. So reading is actually quite good. So if you are consuming like content, having like a larger screens make it much better. This, for example, me with the uh, reading like um, uh, Kindle app on the Surface Duo, it's quite pleasant. Um, you you almost have the feeling of having a real book. Um, yeah, and it makes it basically much much better experience. Uh, also, like watching videos, it's better, and having video calls, uh, especially the folded or half-folded mode, makes it effectively that uh, you have like a, a stand, so you don't need a stand or you don't need to hold uh, the device with your hand. And you can have like, for example, video conferences or just watching video. If you are into gaming, of course, like larger screens make it better experience, and uh, yeah, multitasking, so productivity. Uh, apps or uh, you have the possibility to run multiple uh, apps in parallel um, and yeah and this makes it much better when you you want to be more productive for example emails browsing together and so on and so forth yeah but this also brings new challenges so effectively you have to think or design and build for uh, multiple screen modes or multiple screen states the folded the half folded the open mode you have to think about uh, transition. So uh, when you actually open the device, if you start something on uh, the folded screen, and then you open it, you have to make sure that you retain the state so that user doesn't have to start everything again, for example. And then you also have like more gestures. Like if you are in the uh, multi-window mode, you might want to, for example, drag and drop content from, from one app to the other. There are also like some interesting UX principle to uh, take a look at when we talk about larger screens. So, yeah, when we switch, for example, from phone to uh, to a screen that has more space, what do we do? Do we just show more content? Well, it's not that straightforward. Here, here is, for example, an example you might recognize it. It's from the early days of the Windows Metro UI. It was heavily based on uh, showing tiles. It was running like from mobile devices to desktop as well. But of course, like if you switch to a bigger screen and you just show more tiles, it's gonna be content overwhelming, right? So there is a law in UX, it's called Hicks law, um, that states that of course, the more options are presented to, to the user, the more time it will take to them to make a decision. So this has to be taken into account when we decide how much content to show. This is another example, it's like uh, uh, web TV. Uh, that has quite a few layers of navigations, right? So you have content, but before getting to that content, you have to go through several layers. And for a user, this is like pain in a way. So, for example, Netflix does it a little bit better. Um, it keeps the navigation quite simple on the left, but then, and then tries to maximize the content, so the visuals, so that, and also like kind of being proactive, so that users don't have to think too much what to, uh, what to choose, even though sometimes it can still be difficult to choose what to see or what to watch. But yeah, um, so it's quite important to be aware of this cognitive overload. So we have more space, but we always have to balance it with the content that we can show and the usability. Another use case is like when we are, uh, we have, for example, like text heavy apps. This is like an example from Wikipedia. Wikipedia, I love Wikipedia, but to be honest, on larger screen, it's not the best experience you can have. 
For example, this is like a Chrome extension. It's called WikiWand. It takes the, Wiki pa the Wikipedia page, but optimizes it for better readability. So uh, it shows like a smaller width, a shorter width, and then increases the, the, the line height of the text. And it's much, much more pleasant to read. Same thing, for example, medium. Medium never uh, exceeds 80 characters per line. So this is also to, to keep in mind when we have larger screen, we have to keep control of our width and the number of characters we show. Now there are a couple of UI patterns that we can uh, follow when we design for larger screen screens. Um, I'll just like uh, go through some of them. So the first one is called reveal. So effectively what you don't show on, on smaller screens, like on phones, you can actually show it on larger ones because you have more space. So this is like uh, the same app example of before. It's a sport app. What you have is basically like um, kind of a hidden, um, uh, hidden list in, in, into a drop down. It's basically, you can pick up different match days. Um, it requires like double tap. On bigger devices, what you can show is basically to show the whole list. So one interaction or one step less, and then like more visibility for the user. Another one is called, tran uh, another pattern is called transform. So this is quite a common one. What you, maybe you can, you can, you can have, for example, like a list view on smaller devices, can transform, for example, into card view on uh, larger devices. This is, for example, a list of teams. On larger devices, becomes like card, uh, card grid, basically. Divide. Uh, effectively, it's similar to the other one. You have like a list view on the uh, smaller device on the phone. Then you have to tap and to go into detail view. But what you can do is actually to show both list and the detail view on larger device. So list detail. This is also like mentioned later on in the, when we look at uh, canonical layout. You can reflow content. So effectively find different position uh, of the content uh, depending on the device width. This is again an example in which we had um, a sort of tab view uh, or tab navigation. So there is a kind of hero uh, part at the top that shows the score of the game. And then you could switch um, content using the tab view. And on the larger device, instead of switching tabs, you can actually, for example, having a horizontal scrolling, so you can actually show more content at the same time. Then you have expand. Uh, expand is basically when effectively you cannot, in this case, for example, um, reflow to, from list to cards. And uh, in this case, it's a ranking. So if you would switch this to cards, you would lose the ranking. So what you can do is to keep the same kind of vertical layout, but for, the, for what we mentioned before, we have to control the width in a way. So for example, we give it like a maximum width so that, for example, the content, you can still relate it together. So it's not like lost on the left and right screen of the screen. And yeah, last but not least is to, to reposition. So for example, like on smaller devices, you might have like a fab on a tab reach, but you hold like a um, folded devices or a, on a tablet, for example, in a different way. So you might want to reposition that uh, button. And this, for example, it's what we did uh, with, the, with this button here, which was part of this uh, card element, and it was repositioned uh, on a different level when we switched to the card view. So yeah, now let's look a little bit into the canonical layouts. So canonical layouts um, are an uh, example of layouts that the material design tree guidelines give. Effectively, they're based on window site classes. So you have uh, some breakpoints and three main, um, let's say, uh, yeah, width. So the compact um, uh, sites class, the medium and the expanded one. And for each of those sites classes, you can apply uh, one canonical layout. So for example, you have feed, you have supporting pane, and list detail. And uh, those basically will look different depending on the sites class. 
Here we have like an example uh, of, uh, of an app that we built internally a uh, couple of years ago. Uh, it's Zeppelin, you might have used it. It's a quite famous collaboration tool between developers and designers. And uh, they released like, the API publicly, and then we decided to yeah, try it out and build like, a mobile app. And in our case, like, what we, we thought of, or the core use case uh, for this app, is effectively when you want to check notes or comments from your collaborators. So you are on the way, and you want to see like, an, a comments and reply to it on a specific design screen, for example. So if we take the feed uh, layout, what we can uh, do here is to reflow to a larger screen. So we switch from uh, two-column layout to four-column layout. Another thing that uh, we can do, for example, is to um, uh, reposition the bottom navigation to a navigation rail on the side and then to expand, for example. We have used like three kind of common patterns in this case. Um, another canonical layout is the supporting pane. So in this case, this is quite a core screen of the app because you have um, comments that, uh, of a note, for example, that are placed on a, on a sort of bottom view. And then, uh, of course, you have like small space on the phone, so if the comments gets longer, the, the bottom view kind of hides part of the screen. But you don't want to lose content on uh, larger screens, so what you can do in this case is to move uh, or reposition the bottom panel to a right side panel, and uh, effectively you can keep the screen uh, in context and um, Sorry. Uh, yeah, keep the screen uh, in context so you know what the notes are referring to and at the same time utilize most of the screens that the larger device gives you. And last but not least, you have the list detail. So list detail, it's effectively a shortcut. So instead of just showing the list, you can show the list item and then all the different detail views that belong to that list. Well, and now we come up uh, with the code part. One of the things that we have been trying to do at this uh, session, a uh, special collaboration between designers and uh, developers, is to provide both points of view. One of them, the designer one, and the other one, the, the one from the engineering point of view. And I guess uh, many of you are developers here, probably. How many designers are here? Can you raise your hand? Oops, not many. Yeah, I could imagine that. Well, um, let's gonna talk about the navigation. We need to have navigation, right? When we are uh, creating our foldable app, and we have uh, different types that we can use also based on the different setup and uh, configuration of the application. We can have the bottom navigation for smaller screens, you know, the one that goes at the bottom with an icon and the title of the screen that you want to navigate with. And uh, this would be the bottom navigation view components. See that all of them are material components, so specifically we're using here material three. And uh, well, um, in this case would be the dot bottom navigation, dot bottom navigation view. We also have the rail navigation for medium screens. Those of them that are a little bit bigger, but not that big, could be using this component, which uh, again, belongs to the material package and would be navigation rail dot navigation rail view. And uh, the one for the full navigation for larger screens, the one with a well, full uh, expandable uh, menu with a title and um, um, an icon would be the uh, navigation view component, also uh, depending from navigation. See here, showcase in red, that we are using this width qualifier to include each of those uh, layouts uh, for a specific, um, uh, specific uh, screen sizes. So we are also using the minus W width qualifier and not the smaller one, the minus SW. So ideally you would have different screens that go in these different uh, layout folders and can be <coughs> incorporated on, on runtime depending on the device that you are having with. 
Another important aspect is that the app should have a single navigation graph uh, uh, model for every different experience. It's, it should not be changing on different, uh, uh, based on the configuration, if you're resizing the screen or if you're uh, changing from portrait to landscape. Think of a web browser where you need to change the navigation each time you resize it or you use it on desktop and mobile, it would be pretty much impossible or, or really hard to handle, right? So. Uh, in Android, we have a few ways to <coughs> handle the, we'll go later into that, to handle the, the navigation, but we need to keep in mind that it needs to be unique through all the potential configurations for the app. Let's talk about a few of the uh, canonical layouts that my colleague Pierre was speaking and how we can get them implemented in terms of code. So the first one is the list detail, right? We have the list on the left side and the content on the right side, and well, when we click, we are changing the content dynamically. We could use a setup like this one. There is this uh, widget called sliding pain, uh, pain layout uh, that contains two um, uh, sub nodes within it. One is going to be the one for the drawer and the other one the main for the content. How we can determine sizes and how they um, appear on the screen? Well, see that we have the width value. This one we can define it uh, statically, 300, 400, whatever we want to have. Uh, typically the drawer is smaller than the content. And then something interesting is that we can use the weight to distribute the extra space. This is a little bit different of how we use the, the weight in, in other applications. So let's say in our case, we're having uh, one and one for the weight. It could be something like one, two. Typically, it should resemble the proportion between the width um, in the two views. And what we are going to have is something like this. The, the list screen will take the dynamic value that we provided, 300. The content view will take the dynam dynamic value that we provided, 400. And if there is any extra space, we're going to divide the weight that we have specified to each of those screens. Uh, but of course, we not, uh, don't have always uh, enough extra space. So if there is not enough room, each pane uh, will use the full width of the, of the parent. So it would be either the left screen or the right screen in the, um, in the, shape, in the window that is being displayed. Now, we talk about navigation. We have several way, ways of uh, applying navigation in an app that is using foldables, and uh, I'm going to mention two of them. One would be when we're using fragments, right? Uh, you just have fragments and a fragment manager, and you are dynamically loading or uh, removing fragments depending on uh, the screen that you want to display. So you could have something like an open details uh, function that receives the, uh, the item ID that you want to display. And see here that we're using the child fragment manager to replace one fragment with another one. And then we will call the, um, at the bottom, right at the bottom, the sliding pane layout uh, open function. We use the transaction, we put a fragment, replace a fragment, and then the content on the screen gets updated. But of course, that's painful. Uh, we also can use the navigation graph and the graph controller. And uh, in this case, well, we would be using the navigation options. And typically what we do is, well, we have the nav controller, we need to uh, specify a, um, a destination and uh, the new graph, uh, the new screen that is coming, and that's much easier. We can also rely on the navigation graph file, so it's uh, way less error prone uh, than working with fragments. If you have been working manually with fragment navigation, you probably know what I'm talking about. Now, um, yeah, something um, interesting as well is that in uh, smaller devices, the list and the details pane can overlap, right? Because the, the screen size is uh, limited. So in this case, we need to ensure that the system back bottom is going to take from the detail pane back into the, into the list one. We have the option of providing a custom back uh, navigation handling using this on back press called. Uh, we have a few functions here that we need to override on panel, on panel slide, on panel open, on panel close. And then based on this, we can see what to do with the app. So typically, the back button should close any panel that is not main, that is on the screen, and we should allow the user to get the, um, back to the main content at, uh, at some point. But again, there might be some specifics, right? Maybe you want to open the, the drawer panel based on, on a certain configuration, etc. Now, let's gonna go to the fifth canonical layout. This one is easy, is the one that is the pattern that it typically found in a social network or, um, or news uh, where you can like well scroll, um, scroll down and, and see more uh, content and load it dynamically. For something on a simple screen uh, from a phone, we could use the linear layout manager. That's easy, we just keep adding content there. 
And for screens that get a little bit more complex, we have a few more options. We have the Grid Layout Manager, the Flexbox Layout Manager, and the Stagger Grid uh, Layout Manager. Uh, with grids, we can also change dynamically rows and columns and uh, makes uh, facilitates a little bit the, the process. The supporting pane. Uh, the supporting pane prioritizes content at the top of the screen, and it uses supporting content at the below this and at the at the side. So a typical uh, uh, thing would be what you have in, for example, in YouTube, right? You have the main video, and then you can see the related ones and the um, feed where the people are griping and talking about um, specifying whatever about the video. So we have a, arguably there is a pane called uh, Hero, uh, which might be a subtype of the previous one. See that the difference between this one and this one is pretty much that the hero area, the one that we want to highlight, goes at the top and takes the full width of the screen. Similar to when you are in the YouTube screen and you click on a theater mode, this uh, screen takes sort of ownership of the, um, the region at the top of the screen. This could be a, um, a way of getting it organized. So typically, we are going to have a hero uh, pane here at the top that is going to keep the, this uh, um, dimension uh, ratio of uh, 16 to 9. Um, we will have the description, the one that goes directly on the below and to the left. Um, we could give something like uh, with this width percent, we can specify, for instance, 0 0.6, and that would be 60% of the total size. And then the up next, which is going to take the remaining space under the hero section and to the right of the description one. And uh, those constraints can be changed and animated using motion layout. So this allows us to work with a uh, nice animation, such as moving, uh, changing the size of uh, the different panes and moving them from the top to the bottom. Now, constraint sets. Uh, of course, layouts can change the, uh, the status, that, the state that they have, and uh, we have a three potential uh, set of constraints. One of them is closed, the foldable, it's, uh, well, um, seems like an, an standard phone, folded or um, fully open. In folded, is not, um, does not contain the, the fully open state, and fully open is, well, pretty much a, a expanded uh, phone or double the phone. And we have post postures as well. So um, a posture would be when you are uh, reading it on a certain orientation. So could, you could be reading it as a book or you could be using it as a, ta as a tablet. And based on this, we also might want to um, adapt our content. Let's see how we can detect uh, folding features. There is a new, uh, new, well, new uh, library from Google called uh, Jetpack Window Manager. The first version, the alpha one, I think it was released uh, more than a year ago. Uh, the latest one, like uh, April this year, and well, um, you would need to include it in a, as a dependency in your Gradle file. And uh, <coughs> sorry, by using this library, we can start finding um, sizes of the folds, the uh, folding features that we have activated on the device, etc. See that we have um, this uh, uh, window info tracker um, class um, that uh, well goes uh, belongs to this library. And uh, we would need, uh, this is an example where we are running well, in, a, in an application on create within a coroutine. And by calling this function here, window layout info, we could get all the foldable features that are activated for this specific device, or none if the device doesn't support any, any uh, is not a foldable device. And of course, it also has support for Compose. So if you're using Compose, you could adapt a little bit the code and, uh, well, have, uh, when you call the, fun the function, uh, set content, where you need to start adding your composables, you could pretty much pass this as a parameter, and then inside the composable, you can check whether your device supports folding features or not, and then start um, coding accordingly. Now, folding features allows us also to find out the posture of a device, whether it's uh, on the book mode or whether it's as, uh, on the tabletop mode. Uh, for that, we will need to use, this is an extension function in Kotlin, right? So we are, uh, uh, yeah, this can be used as a part of the folding feature object. We pretty much compare the uh, or combine the a comparison of the state and the orient orientation to see if the device is well half open uh, vertically or half open horizontally. And depending on this, our app can react accordingly. Emulators, of course, we want to use emulators, right? Especially because the foldable devices are not quite affordable yet. And if you need to buy the Windows one, the Samsung, and then the rollable one, you might need to get a salary hike, uh, which is probably not very easy in the um, current times. But Google has us covered. If you go to the um, virtual device uh, manager, where you can uh, create different um, um, emulators, you see that you have, um, for example, here an 8 inches fold out, 7.6 uh, inches folding with the outer display. And very funnily, 
a rollable device. A rollable device uh, contains different roles, so more or less uh, emulates this capacity of a device of rolling over itself, and it's very messy. I haven't uh, tried it in, in real life, but um, uh, if you actually create one of those devices, you can see how you can emulate those uh, behaviors. And um, yeah, if you add on the, uh, you create the device, uh, then you have those extended controls when you can manage things like the GPS position, microphone, um, simulate like phone calls, etc. One of them is virtual sensors, and see that in there we can uh, simulate the fall, we can change the posture, and see how it is uh, reacting in any scenario. We also have the layout validation. This uh, takes a layout that you have uh, created and uh, provides you sort of a preview for different screen configurations, so you can also get a more or less heads up of how things are behaving. Uh, if you want to find this um, uh, screen from here, you need to open on your Android Studio a layout file. And you see here on the right, there is this layout validation menu that has been clicked uh, right under uh, Device Manager. Uh, it only works if you have an XML file that belongs to a layout open, otherwise it's not going to appear. You just need to click there and see that you're going to have four different screens, one for the phone, foldable, tablet, and desktop. So that's the way you have to see out of the box how your app will um, behave and um, if you're applying any, uh, anything specific, what's, what's going to happen. Locating the fault. Then uh, folding feature also has the location of the fault on the window. This can help you to make uh, adjustments to the UI, like uh, keeping, for instance, a hero element above the fault and making sure it's not falling underneath or whatever you need to do on your app. In order to do that, is uh, well, uh, we could use a function like this. Uh, there is this get location in window function that we call in within the function in the second line that gives us the location of the content content uh, view in the window. We need to make a transformation to change the coordinate systems into the window systems, and uh, when that has been done, then uh, yeah, well, we need to um, also get the bound of the fault. We see where they inter intersect, and this function would uh, return the, um, the, the point where they're actually colliding, and well, um, you could be able to say, like, th there is this fold on the device, and I will make sure that the uh, layout is going to be above it or underneath it or um, whatever. Um, yeah, there are a few links here that I think are going to be interesting for you. Um, at the top, you can learn more about foldables, the documentation from Google, where they specify, well, how to um, um, learn about development uh, for large screens, a few of the tricks. They cover a few things that uh, would, be, would have been uh, maybe too much to cover on this one, such as testing on uh, foldable devices like a UI test, how to perform them. So it's, it's a nice uh, starting point. Material design covered all the nice practices when we're working with uh, canonical layouts, the do's, the don't, um, things that you should be aware of, good practices. This foldable market forecast 2023, uh, it's, uh, I believe, a forecast of uh, what we can expect in this uh, year for foldable uh, devices. Is, uh, as you can probably see by doing a little bit of research, the um, proportion of devices in the market is, is not that much. On the other hand, they're uh, growing quite a bit, uh, like 53%, I think my colleague uh, Pierre mentioned. Of course, uh, one, if it's like 1% and it grows 53%, it's still not that much, but well, I think the potential is there and we have more and more things coming into the market. And um, yeah, last but not least, um, there is this very interesting code lab um, um, to teach you how to use the window manager. It's, it's pretty quick. Uh, you can probably get it done in a couple of hours and uh, yeah, gives you some further information on the window manager object and how to use it. Uh, we have a couple of comments more. Um, uh, Ejal, one of the organizers, asked me if I could uh, let you know, and uh, there is an app clinic tomorrow in the morning. Uh, so if you have any app and you would like a committee of people to take a look on the app and give you some feedback, things that can get improved on, at, at any level, you can contact them on this uh, email and they will um, let you know the instructions. I think you need to tell them the, the application that you want them to, uh, to get it checked and um, go tomorrow if you want to see it. Last but not least, we appreciate your feedback. So uh, here on this QR code, there is a, a small form uh, where you can leave us some feedback about the presentation. Uh, I promise you it's not going to take you more than two minutes. And uh, if you do that, we'll send you a copy of one book I wrote uh, some time ago, Living by the Code, where I did some interviews to some developers. I think it's good, obviously. Uh, but yeah, uh, we really rely a lot on your feedback. It helps us a lot to, uh, to, to keep improving the presentation and see what people find more useful or less useful and get it better for the future. So 
Thank you, everybody. You have been a fantastic public.